Well, I thought tonight we could talk about a topic that came up on Sunday. On Sunday, a parishioner was listening to or watching some YouTube thing or something. And uh, it was obviously he was watching some Christian apologetic thing because then it auto loaded for him a anti-Christian Islamic video in which the guy uh, was, as a Muslim, trying to argue that Christians are all confused about this Jesus, even confused about their own Bible. And the argument went like this. Jesus, as Muslims believe, was not God. And even the scriptures of the Christians prove this. Because there's nowhere in the Christian scriptures, the New Testament, that Jesus says, I'm God. Hmm. Now think about that. That's interesting. And at first glance, that sounds pretty impressive. You know, out of all the New Testament books, four Gospels, 14 epistles of Paul, Catholic epistles, book of Revelation, nowhere does Jesus ever claim to be God. Clearly say, I'm God. This is how the argument went. So, therefore, as the Muslim would like to argue, therefore, Jesus is not God. Okay, now there's three lawyers logged in. They can all hear, I'm sure, the weakness of this argument. Okay, since Jesus never claimed to be God, or at least a Muslim doesn't see it in the New Testament text, and therefore it must not be there, uh, then Jesus is not God. That's how the argument goes. Well, it's kind of impressive. It kind of impressed one of my parishioners. Like, oh, no, what's, the, what's the answer to this? I mean, if, if Jesus is God, why didn't he say I'm God? Somewhere, at least in the New Testament. Somewhere, somewhere, right? Muslim apologetic smoke and mirrors. All right, now, the first thing we need to look at is what about passages in the New Testament that say that Jesus is God? Now, we're going to look at passages where Jesus says he's God, but we're going to, I'm going to rewind it back a second before we get there. Because my response was, well, I mean, there's, there's passages where Jesus implies these things, but he said, yeah, but as this, as this Muslim was saying, that while there are places in the New Testament says Jesus is God, there's nowhere where Jesus says he's God. And again, you can hear the problem here. Okay, so let's just really think this one through. The New Testament authors are the record of Jesus' words. And therefore, if the New Testament authors tell you Jesus is God, it's identical with Jesus saying he's God. Here's why. If Jesus said he was God, and he wasn't, and it's recorded in the New Testament, it's him saying I was God, then the New Testament authors are making up the story, right? The authors are giving the record of Jesus' words. So if the authors are, are falsifying information, as this Muslim was saying, by saying Jesus is God, that, that's, that's not true. But the, but the fact is, if you look at the text where the New Testament authors record Jesus' words, no one in those spots that Jesus actually says God. So you see, there's two, there's two different bits of information in the Testament, in the Christian scriptures. There's the record of Jesus' words in which he never claims to be God. But then there's certainly, yes, of course, lots of passages in the New Testament where the authors of the text claim he's God. You see, this is completely insane. Okay, if the authors of the New Testament are making up a story and trying to say Jesus is God, and they wanted to in some way prove that by making the Jesus character in their made-up stories say something, they would have done it. And in fact, if the authors themselves tell you Jesus is God, Jesus is God, but nowhere in the New Testament record of Jesus' words by these same authors does Jesus claim to be God, it really doesn't make any difference because the words of Jesus recorded in the New Testament are written there by the same authors. 
you're assuming that the, the, the fallacy here by the Muslim is that somehow there's two sources of information in the New Testament. There's the words of Jesus, which are somehow free-floating, independent bits of information that make it onto the page, apart from the fluff around it written by these authors, which is tragically actually a Protestant idea. I probably got it from that. The Red Letter Bible drives me nuts, right? As if somehow there's a distinction between what Jesus said and the author said. The author is telling you what Jesus said. This is the author's words about Jesus and about what he said. All right, so uh, so anyway, let's just take that argument. Take that argument that there are two bits of information. There's what the what Jesus says in the New Testament, and then what the authors say about. It. So first of all, let's deal with what even the Muslim accepts that the New Testament does certainly claim the divinity of Jesus. That the authors of the New Testament show you in many ways that Jesus is. God, we could spend about oh, a whole semester on this one, but we don't have that much time. So I'm just going to hit the big ones for you, just kind of remind you of some passages and things like this. So first of all, turn with me to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. From the beginning of the New Testament, the authors are showing you that Jesus is the Christ, the King, right? the, the line of David. All right, but then you, right from the beginning, even from the first, the beginning of it, you get hints like this. Look at this. Chapter 1, verse 22. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Now, do you know of any ladies in your neighborhood who have ever gotten pregnant without a man? Actually, you know, modern medicine. Okay, that aside. So the, they're still for the help of men. So women are impregnated by men. So, so the, the point here, right from the beginning, Matthew chapter 1, is though Jesus is inheriting the throne of his father David. He's not actually naturally the son of David, but rather has some sort of divine origin. And that's why he shows you the virgin birth. And then, to emphasize that, he says, Behold, a virgin shall conceive by a son. He quotes from Isaiah. And his name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Okay? So right from the beginning. And it goes on like this. I mean, this is in chapter 2. Wise men show up. A star. They fall in the east. If you go and look at the story here, and they bring gold and frankincense, this should remind you of Isaiah 60. Now, if you go and look at Isaiah 60, it's a story all about the Gentile kings of the earth and their nations coming to worship the king of Israel, who is also the God of Israel. So Isaiah 60 is about the nations coming into the people of God to worship one true God as the king of the universe. Now, if you look at the story of Matthew here, you have wise men coming, representing that, bringing their golden phrases, coming to worship Jesus, who is the king. So again, right there from the beginning, you get these subtle hints, even in the story at what's coming. In fact, it starts to not become so subtle. When you get to chapter uh, 3, you have the baptism story. And I mentioned to you in other studies how you can see how in Matthew's gospel, he's showing Jesus as the new Israel. You even got that uh, from earlier in chapter 2, verse 15, out of Egypt I have called my son. You get this quote from Hoshea, the prophet. So Jesus, well, who's out of Egypt? Who's he, what son of God came out of Egypt? Israel. Israel is the firstborn son of God, Exodus chapter 4. Out of Egypt, I call my son. So Jesus means shown to be the new Israel. Not only the son of David, but the new Israel. Now, as son of David, we are getting hints that he's also not only the human king, but divine king. We already saw that. But now we're hearing he's not just the son of David, king of Israel. He's actually the new Israel. The people of God. Now, when you're hearing that, what do you think? On the flip side, it's going to be 
He's also the God of the people of God. So you're going to get that now. He's coming out of Egypt, and instead of crossing the Red Sea and going into the wilderness for 40 years, he crosses the Jordan and goes to the wilderness for 40 days. As you read the story of the wilderness 40 days, you can see it's intended to be a parallel to the 40 years of the wilderness. That Jesus even quotes from Deuteronomy 6 through 8, where, it's where, where Moses is quoting from the story of the wilderness wanderings and the temptations of the wilderness. So there's no one who can read Matthew chapters 2 and 3 and not see this kind of parallel structure. Jesus is coming out of Egypt. Israel came out of Egypt. Out of Egypt, I call my son. He crosses a body of water and then goes to the wilderness for a desert, you know, and is hungry and thirst and the whole thing, just like Israel in the wilderness. 40 days, 40 years, the whole thing, the quotes. But many have noted that, well, that's really neat, but there's a little bit of a problem there, isn't there? What is it? Well, he's crossing the wrong body of water. Israel crossed the Red Sea, not the Jordan in between Egypt and the 40 years wandering in the wilderness. They crossed the Red Sea, not the Jordan. Man, Matthew, couldn't you like change the story and made him go across the Red Sea? No, because if we heard about Jesus just crossing the Red Sea, it would completely destroy the whole point we're talking about tonight that Matthew's trying to make. Jesus would simply still just be the new Israel doing the same thing Israel did. But he wants to show you that he's not only the new Israel or the new people of God, he wants to show you that he's also the God of the people of God. Just like he showed you he's the human king and he showed you the divine king. Now he's the people of God, now he's showing you the God of the people of God. And the very fact that he crossed the Jordan instead of the Red Sea is this point. So when the Israel crossed the Red Sea, do you remember at the end of their wilderness wandering, they crossed the Jordan and entered the Promised Land, right? So the, watering, the water crossings are for the ancient Israelite. Both the Red Sea and the Jordan are bookends, are, is a framing device on the whole Exodus story. And the fact that they're understood in parallel and like bookends is shown in at least two, if not many other places, in the Old Testament in the Jewish literature. So hold your hand there and flip back to Joshua, Joshua chapter 4. Joshua chapter 4. Okay. So this is the story on the other end of the Exodus. They've crossed the Red Sea. They've been in the wilderness for 40 years. Now they're going to go into the promised land with Joshua. And in chapter 4, it says, this is verse 23. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which you dried up for you until you had passed over. So you get right there in the book of Joshua a parallelism between the two events, like a framing device, and that the cross of the Jordan is being understood in light of the cross of the Red Sea. Both happened to happen by the power of God. It wasn't Moses. It wasn't Joshua. It wasn't Moses that parted the waters. It wasn't Joshua that caused the Jordan to dry up. It was the power of God who was among them. And that parallelism between the two and the real point of the story, God's presence among them, is what Matthew's pointing at. Flip over to Psalm 113 or 114. Psalm 114. 113, however you want to count. Okay, so in the Septuagint, this is Psalm 113. In most Bibles, English Bibles, Psalm 114. When Israel went forth from Egypt, the house of Jacob, from a people of strange language. That's called synonymous parallelism. This is how ancient uh, Israel, how they, when they made poetry, they used synonymous parallelism. We like rhyme and rhythm. They had no interest in rhythm and no interest in rhyme as far as we're concerned. But what they did like was synonymous parallelism. That's how they made their poetry. When Israel went forth from Egypt, element one, element two, the house of Jacob from a people of strange language, is to say the same thing the same way, synonymous parallelism. Judah became his sanctuary, Israel his dominion. 
anyone who's ever read the Psalms or the Prophets knows how this works. This is very, this is typical of, of Hebrew poetry. Verse 3, the sea looked and fled, that's the Red Sea, the Jordan turned back. Same time? No. When was the beginning of the story? When was the end? Right? The sea looked and fled, the Jordan turned back. Notice the author is seeing these as parallel events, related events. The mountains skip like rams, the hills like lambs. What ails you, O sea, that you flee? O Jordan, that you turn back. O mountains, that you skip like rams. O hills, like lambs. Tremble, O earth, at the presence of Yahweh. At the presence of the God of Jacob. Okay, so this is what Matthew is expecting you to know. The New Testament authors, the New Testament Christians, the Jews in the first century, had the Psalms memorized. Really? I mean, every little bit? Yeah, start singing for me a song from Michael Jackson. Okay, so I can't do it. What? Wait, well, I can do it. I grew up in the 80s. And some of you could sing a song from the Beatles, okay? Some of you from Elvis or something for me. Some of you wouldn't know who these are. You want to, you know, sing something more modern. I don't know. But we know, think of how many songs you know just from modern secular world. And then if I went into the religious songs, you know. So the Jews, they didn't have a radio. They didn't have secular songs. They had simply the Psalms. What we call the Book of Psalms, the 150 Psalms, those are the 150 songs they sang on different occasions, different situations, when they're going to bed, when they're waking up in the morning, when they're rocking their baby asleep, when they're out there working in the ditch. Or they sang those. Those were the songs they sang. Okay, so they had them memorized. And so for a first century Jewish audience, it's very clear for what Matthew's trying to do here. He's trying to show that, as he showed before, that Jesus is the presence of God among them. He is Emmanuel. And that's why he tells the story of Jesus' early life here, his childhood and growing up, all the way to his public ministry, in a way that will remind you of the life of Israel coming out of Egypt, so that he can show you the parallelism of the cross and the Red Sea with the, with the Jordan. So he can show you that Jesus is not just the people of God coming out of Egypt, but he's also the God of the people of God. He is the presence of God among them. Now, the New Testament authors do this over and over and over and over and over and over again. Let's flip over to Luke's gospel for a second. And then we'll be done with, the, with these, this type of, this level of imagery. Luke chapter, uh, Luke chapter one, Luke chapter one, verse twenty-six. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, "Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you." She said, "Who is greatly troubled?" Do not be afraid. And then look what, she, look what he says. Verse 31. And behold, you will conceive in your womb, and you will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of the Father David, and he will reign forever. So Mary is being told that the child she's going to conceive is going to be the long-awaited son of David, who will continue that Davidic line, that Davidic promise in 2 Samuel 7. He'll inherit the throne of his father David. He'll be the long way Messiah, the anointed king. Just like Matthew started out, right? Son of David, son of Abraham, he's the genealogy. But just like Matthew does very quickly show you something greater, showing you he's not only the human king, he shows you the divine king. Immediately Mary says, how can this be? And then verse 35, the angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Before, uh, be, and be, therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Okay? Son of God is a title for the Messiah. This one's going to be a Holy Son of God. Holy means distinct, unique, set apart, not like any of them that came before. So, Son of God, title for the king. This is going to be a king that will be unlike all the human kings you had before. Why? Because the Holy Spirit's going to overshadow. That's going to be the cause of the conception. So you have the virgin birth imagery here, just like you have in Matthew. But Luke's doing something more than Matthew is in this particular situation. Matthew or Luke is showing you 
a word here that if you've got ears to hear and eyes to see, you're picking up on something. The word here is episiodzing, overshadow. And to overshadow is a word that appears only four places in the New Testament. Episkiadzim, here, and the three stories of the transfiguration, when the cloud overshadowed them. So it really appears two places in the New Testament. This story and the transfiguration story. But that's perfectly consistent with the Old Testament, because the New Testament Greek is just Jewish Greek. When you go look at Old Testament Greek, translation of the Hebrew and Greek, and Hebrew and Aramaic into Greek, called the Septuagint, you see the same thing. The verb episkiadzin is reserved for only situations where the glory cloud of God rests on the earth. A classic example of this is Exodus chapter 40, verse 35. And the glory cloud rested on the tent of meeting, or the ark rested there. Okay, so what's Luke hoping you're going to pick up on here? Luke's hoping you're going to pick up on something that I think most people are pretty familiar with, and that that is that Mary is being described here as the ark of the covenant, the glory cloud resting on her, just like in Exodus chapter 40, verse 35. But as you continue to read, because you missed that, he emphasizes, he says, and Mary went to the hill country of Judea. This is 2 Samuel 6. And the ark went to the hill country of Judea. And David said, how can, is it the ark of the Lord should come to me? And Elizabeth says, how is the mother of my Lord should come to me? And David's leaping and, and singing and crying out for joy. And John the Baptist is leaping. And Elizabeth is crying out for joy. In fact, all the way down to how long they were there. The ark remained in the house of Obadiah in the hill country of Judea for three months. And everyone got pregnant. And have, they were fertile, it says. Fruitful. Fruitfulness, the presence of God and presence of God. And then the same thing happens here. Mary remains in the hill country of Judea for three months. And Elizabeth in her old age safely gives birth. So you can see the parallel. It's, it screams at you. There's no one you... Obvious, okay? But what's the point? Why is Luke doing this? Well, if Mary's the Ark of the Covenant then that means the baby in her womb is not just the king of the line of David, but is the divine king. That means that he's the presence of God among them. He's the word of God in the flesh. This is one of those parallels between, between John and Luke. All right. Now, that brings us to our next point. Okay, and there's a lot of other passages like this in Matthew and Luke and even Mark. But let's take a look at John where we hear about this idea that Jesus is the word of God. So in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him. Made through him. He's the eternal word of God. Remember, God spoke and it came to be. So he was with God from the beginning. He's the word of God. He's God's voice. When God speaks, he's the revelation of God. Your voice is one of the ways you reveal yourself. So what John's telling you here is that he's not only the word of God through which God spoke and said, let it be and it came to be. He is God himself. And the end of the gospel, the end of John's gospel does the same thing. The end of John's gospel, not only do you have, here you have John, the author, saying this, but how about a character within the story? This is the very, very end of the gospel. You know this probably fairly well. John chapter 20, the apostle Thomas, remember, he comes late, the whole thing. He wants to see Jesus. Jesus comes. And look what happens. This is chapter 20, verse 28. Thomas answered and said, My Lord and my God. And then Jesus says, you know, you really shouldn't say that. It's just, you know, don't, don't use those kinds of words. No. no you believe now? <laughs> there are those who are going to be blessed, but those who believe have not even seen Okay, so Thomas realizes he's standing in the presence of God incarnate. My Lord and my God. Lord there being 
a reference to the circumlocution of the divine name in Jewish literature. We're going to talk about that in a second now. Okay. So there you get in the Gospels. We do this in Mark too. We can, you get in the Gospels. You have these references constantly to Jesus is the, is the human king. He's also the divine king. He's not only the the people, he's not only the people of God, but he's actually the God of the people of God. He's not only the, um, uh, the he's not only, when he speaks, he's not only speaking the words of men, that is his own human voice, but he speaks the word of God. So he's the voice of the Father. All throughout the, the Gospels, you see this. In the Pauline epistles, Okay, now, in the Pauline epistle, what we're doing here is we're looking at places where, which the Muslim accepts, this Muslim apologist accepts that it. it's obviously the New Testament you know, speaks of Jesus as being divine. So look at the first epistle of the Pauline epistles that you have in your canon. And you get this throughout the, um, the Pauline epistles. Let's look at chapter 1, verse 7. Chapter 1, verse 7. And some of this will be a little hard to follow in a certain sense until we get to the next step of what we're talking about. And you can come back and see what's going on here. But right now, I just want to look at the category of that first category. New Testament authors describing Jesus as God. Chapter 1 of Romans, verse 7. And this is in all the point epistles. They all begin this way. Verse 7. To all God's beloved in Rome who are called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You get that in the, the watch this. Hold your hand. Uh, you can flip over to 1 Corinthians. Next epistle. Just as a quick sample of this. So this is uh, chapter 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. To the church of God, which he is in court, to those sanctified in Christ, Jesus called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both those gods. Verse 3, grace to you and peace from God, the fa our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to go all throughout the epistles. This is how Paul begins his epistles. Grace to you, God the Father, and our Lord Jesus Jesus Christ. I had a Jehovah's Witness one time we were talking about this. You know, they denied the divinity of Christ. Look at this. Well, yeah, see, look. He calls God the Father, that's Jehovah. And he calls Jesus just Lord. Mr. Jehovah's Witness, do you know how the divine name that you guys are all into, though you mispronounce it as Jehovah, is translated or is explained or is is circumlocuted in the Greek text of the Old Testament? Kyrios, Lord! When you're looking at New Testament Greek literature, first century New Testament literature, this is in Greek, the word Kyrios is, is related to how the Jews used Greek in their translation of their scriptures. There's no biblical scholar who would say any different. If you want to understand New Testament Greek, you've got to go back and read Old Testament Greek. That is how they translate Hebrew and Aramaic into Greek. That's the model upon which and the major influence upon New Testament usage of Greek. As we already talked about with the verb episkiazi. Okay, so... When you look at the word Lord, Jesus being referred to as the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. Lord in Greek, Kyrios, yes, it means master, one who is above you, one more powerful than you. But this is not just regular, normal first century Greek. This is Jewish Greek, first century Jewish Greek, which everyone knows is influenced by Old Testament Greek. If you go back into the Greek of the Old Testament, the vast majority of the occurrence of the word Kyrios is circumlocutions, that is, putting in place the word Lord, in place of, in the Hebrew, Yahweh. And so what, what Paul's trying to do here is this, is, this is a way to talk about the divinity of Jesus 
in a way that keeps them focused on monotheism, keeps them from slipping into a polytheistic idea. God the Father, now God in Greek, or theos, is the Greek translation of the Hebrew word Elohim in the Old Testament. God, God the Father, Otheos, and the Lord, that is Yahweh, Jesus Christ. So Elohim the Father and Jesus Yahweh. So wait a minute, well, which one's God? They all both are. This the whole point. So this is what he's doing. He's using two different words in the Old Testament that refer to the God of Israel, or we'll say the divine one of Israel, Elohim and Yahweh. Elohim is the word that gets translated as God, Otheos in Greek. And Yahweh is the word that gets translated, circumlocuted, with Kyrios, Lord. So the two different ways in which you refer to the God of Israel or again, that the divine being of Israel is with these two words, God and Yahweh, or Elohim and Yahweh, or Theos and Kyrios, or God and Lord in English. Okay? Now, one other spot in the New Testament where you see the New Testament authors hammering on the divinity of Jesus, okay? So just to, and then we'll be done with that part. And that is in Philippians. Philippians. Uh, oh, there's so many places. I'm turning to Philippians. And like, oh, we're at Colossians. And oh, we could go all these we've gone forever this way. Let's go to Philippians. Take a look. Philippians. Uh, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. He's talking about the humility of Jesus and how the Philippians should model Jesus and be humble and offering themselves like a sacrifice and be willing to lay down their lives for their fellow man. And in doing that, he says, imitate Jesus who did these things. And then he says this. He says, chapter 2, verse uh, five. Have this in mind among yourselves. That is, be willing to sacrifice yourself for your fellow Christian. Have this in mind among yourselves, which was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be held on to, but rather emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of of men. Okay, now, sorry, Mr. Muslim, you got a problem here. If Jesus became man, and formally before he became man, already existed in the form of God, then you already have a problem, Mr. Muslim, okay? Jesus existed before the incarnation, according to Philippians. And in what form did he exist in? In the form of God, but he takes on the form of man in the incarnation. He lets go of that divine form and takes on a human form. Okay? And then he says, And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. I mean, look at this. It says, the form of God. So, well, form of God doesn't necessarily mean he was God. He was in the form. He kind of looked like him, right? Okay, well, he says form of in human form, do you think he wasn't really human? He just kind of looked like it. <laughs> got to be consistent here. So you got to follow Paul's. He was in the form of God. He was in the likeness of God. He was God. Now he became man. He let go of that to become this. Okay. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him. So God, God the Father, you know Pauline language, right? God the Father has highly exalted him. And bestowed on him the name that is above every other name. What name is above every other name, Mr. Muslim? Allah? What name is above every other name, Mr. Jehovah's Witness? Jehovah? Okay. What name is above every other name? If you're a Jew, the divine name, Yahweh. So look what he says. He has bestowed upon him, even in his human form, the divine name. So he says, Bestowed on him the name which is above every other name, 
that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Now, we're not catching the fullness of this thing. At the name of Jesus, Jesus in English sounds like Jesus. And I say Yahweh, and you don't hear the connection. Yahweh, Jesus. What's the connection? Well, that's an English form of a Greek form of an Aramaic form of a Hebrew word. Yahushua. Yah is the short form in, in the Old Testament for the long form Yahweh. It appears a number of places in the Psalms and the Prophets. Yah, short form of Yahweh. Yahushua. Jesus' name, you can look it up in any dictionary, any Hebrew dictionary, even a Jew will tell you this. Yahushua means Yahweh saves. Or Yahweh's Savior, depending on how you want to point the vowels there. Okay, so that at the name of Yahweh saves. So who is Jesus? Yahweh saves. He's God saving us. Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Even the angels. Right? Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ, Jesus the anointed king, line of David, is Yahweh, is Lord. If you don't know the Hebrew behind this thing, you don't follow what Paul's saying here, right? He says, he bestowed upon the names above every other name, that the name of Jesus, every name is bow. So that he was, and so therefore, every time we proclaim that Jesus, the Christ, is Yahweh, is Lord. Is it Yahweh or Lord, which one? Yes, is yes, exactly, that's the whole point, right? Lord, to the glory of God the Father. You see that? For Paul, he refers to the Father as God, and Jesus as Yahweh. So, but in the Old Testament, Yahweh and God are the same. This is the whole point! Okay? All right, so now, look at that word Lord there. You see that? Lord. That every time confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, is Yahweh. Okay? Now you say, Okay, Father, I see what you're saying, but I mean, kind of. I mean, is it is it that clear? Paul's quoting from Isaiah. Paul's quoting from Isaiah. Hold your hand here and flip over to Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45. Now, by, while you're turning there, I'm just, you can't explain this to a Muslim. Muslims are the most irrational people next to Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay, their religion is completely irrational. You read the Quran. It's not in any logical chronological order. So it's completely insane. In the Quran, Muhammad says that it's okay to worship other gods. It's called the satanic verses. Okay, so they, but they don't want, Muslims don't tell you about that because they hope you don't read Arabic, so you won't really know that. That was during the little point of Muhammad's syncretism stuff. So the, it's an irrational religion, completely irrational as is the Watchtower Jehovah's Witness sect. And this is why trying to reason with Jehovah's Witness or reason with a Muslim, if you've ever done either one, it's like you're talking to the same, same people. They're not logical. You can't reason with them logically. It doesn't work. Okay? But since you're rational, I'm going to show you these things. Okay, so we're looking at Isaiah chapter 45. Isaiah chapter 45. Now, in Isaiah, to get, again, to get the, the weight of this, Isaiah, in the middle of the book here, this is the highest concentration of monotheistic statements in the entire Old Testament. So, you look at the entire Old Testament, there is no place where you get the concentration of monotheistic statements like you get in this section of the book of Isaiah. There's many places where you get monotheistic statements in the Old Testament. Tons of them. But in this spot, in Isaiah... And in this particular place in Isaiah, you get it like every other verse. It's highly concentrated monotheistic statements. Very important for Paul. Look what it says here. I'll just give you some examples of this. And this will be important for our last one we're going to, well, not our last one. One of the, yeah, one of the last verses we'll look at. Okay, chapter uh, 40. You start to see them here in about 41. They start to start picking up. Chapter 41, verse 4. Who has performed and done this? Calling the generation from the beginning. I, the Lord, Yahweh, the first and with the last, I am he. So there's what, your first one. There's probably some earlier than that. But you start to get these monotheistic statements right around here. Okay? 
All right, now, next one, chapter 41. Uh, let's see here. Mm, let's go to go to chapter 43. And there's other ones here, but this is... Oh, no, okay, I'm sorry. Chapter 42, chapter 42, verse 8. I should have laid all these out for you before the study. Chapter 42, verse 8. I am Yahweh. I am the Lord. That is my name. That's my name, Yahweh, Lord. My glory I give to no other. Hmm. Okay. Now, chapter 43. Chapter 43. Verse 10. You are my witnesses, says the Lord, Yahweh, my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. Verse 11. I, I am Yahweh. And besides me, there is no Savior. There is no Savior. There is no other God but Yahweh. And also notice here, he refers to himself as the suffering servant. Verse 13. I am God. And also henceforth, I am he. Okay. Chapter 43, verse 15. I am Yahweh, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Uh, chapter 44, verse 5. This one will say, I am, Yah I am the Lord's. Another will call himself by the name of Jacob. Another will write, let's see, certain Israel. Oh, there it is, verse 6. Verse 6. Thus says Yahweh, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord, the host. Verse 6. I am the first. I am the last. Besides me, there is... No, God. Uh, chapter 44, verse 24. Thus says the Lord your God, the Redeemer, you performed you from the womb. I am Yahweh who made all things, who stretched out the heavens alone, alone. Who spread out the, the earth. Who was with me? No one, right? God was alone when he created the world. But wasn't the word with him? Yeah. Therefore, the word was God. Okay, chapter 45. Chapter 45, verse, uh, verse 5. I am Yahweh. There is no other besides me. There is no God. I gird you, though you do not know me. Take your center here. Uh, verse 6. And from the west, there is none besides me. I am Yahweh. There is no other. I form the light, create darkness. I am a etc. Um, chapter 45, and here we come to our statement now, and it, a bunch, there's a bunch of these afterwards too. So it's kind of like right in the center of this high concentration of monotheistic statements. Now we come to that one Paul was referring to. This is chapter 45, verse, let's start up at verse 21 to get the flow of this. Chapter 45, verse 21 of Isaiah. Declare in present your case. Let them take counsel together. Who told this long ago? Who declared of old? Was it not I, Yahweh? There is no other God besides me. A righteous God and a Savior. There is none besides me. Verse 22. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is no other. By myself I have sworn. For my mouth has gone forth in righteousness, a word that shall not return. To me every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall swear. Only in, Yah in Yahweh, in the Lord, it shall be said of me, our righteousness and strength. Okay, it goes on and on. Okay, so what's Paul doing? Flip back to Philippians and look at this now. Every tongue proclaim, every knee must bow. Look back at Philippians. Okay, Philippians chapter 2. Look at this. So, he's telling him, be humble as 
uh, and be humble and give your life up for others. And he's telling the Philippians this. And then he says, you know, look at Jesus, what he did. And then he, he says, verse 5, this is Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Have in this mind among yourself, which was in Christ Jesus also, right? Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality of God with God, but they knew he grasped. But rather emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form. So he went from being in God form to human form. And he, he didn't just stop there. Being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to death even, even death on a cross. It doesn't get any lower than that. Therefore God, the Father, has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. You don't even need to keep reading. You know what he's saying. But he, he'll finish it off. The name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow. In heaven and on earth, and every tongue confess. This is right of Isaiah chapter 45. Isaiah 45, verse 23. That every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Yahweh, is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So when Paul says God the Father and Jesus, Lord Jesus, he's not somehow, you know, putting Jesus on a lower, lower level here. What he's doing is he's emphasizing constantly that Jesus is actually the revelation of the Father. He's actually the revelation of God. When Moses said, who are you? What's your name? I, what am I going to say about you? And he reveals himself. He says, here's my name. So the divine name is the revelation of the invisible God. The, he's the way to know the unknowable. And so this is... This is Paul's whole point here. All right. Now, those are, as long as we're here, I can't resist it. We're right next to Colossians, so just give me a second. Look at this in Colossians. It's everywhere, okay? Look at Colossians chapter, oh, let's see here, chapter 1, verse 19. Chapter 1, verse 19. For in him all the fullness of God. Now, what's fullness of? Fullness is like sort of? fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Right? For in him, this is chapter 1, verse 19 of Colossians, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Not just part of it, some of it, a little flavor, a hint, a mist, no, fullness of. Okay, he says it again later on. He says in chapter 2, verse 9, for in him the whole fullness, look at that, whole. Is it part? No, whole. Fullness? Do you say like, you know, weak, or, you know, less than that or something? No. Whole fullness of deity, of divinity, dwells bodily. This is the New Testament teaching. Jesus is the temple of God. He is God dwelling on earth in an earthly tent in this human nature. And of course, through Jesus, that's what we all become. Right? In baptism of Christ, we all become Christ. We become Christians. God dwelling in, in an earthly tent. What a high calling we have. All right, more on that later. Now, that is what the New Testament authors say about Jesus. There is no way, and again, we could spend hours on this, no way to deny, if anyone reads the New Testament carefully, the New Testament authors believed that Jesus was God. All right. But the Muslim apologist says, yes, 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 I know that. However, where do you find Jesus himself saying it? And I already talked about how silly that is. The three lawyers here logged in realize how ridiculous that statement is. If you're, gonna, if you're going to take these authors' words about what Jesus said as true, then you must also accept the same level of truth what they say about him. But forget rationality for a second. Now, what did Jesus, did Jesus actually ever say he was divine? Oh, yeah. There's a lot of really nice places to take a look at. We don't have time to look at every single one of them. But let's just take a couple of the zingers, okay? Let's look at John's Gospel again. John's Gospel, turn with me to chapter 8. John chapter 8.
Jesus has been saying all the way through his ministry, I am, I am, I am, I am, I am the, I am the light, I am the life, I am, I am, okay? And these I am statements, there's some beautiful ones in this gospel. Look what, he, what happens here in chapter 8. The Jews are finally fed up with it. He keeps saying, I am, I am, I am. And why are they fed up? Well, remember, what is I am? I am is the English translation of the Hebrew Ehye. Back in Exodus chapter 3, when Moses said, but if I go to the sons of Israel and say that the God of their ancestors, their fathers, has sent me to you, what will I say your name is? I mean, give me something. Come on. And he says, oh, tell them this. Ehye asher ehye. I am who I am. You tell them that. See what they say. Now that gets translated from the Hebrew. This is Exodus 3.14. As ego imi ho'on, I am he who is. Which is exactly the way the Jews understood that, and still today understood that statement, a statement of, of God's eternal existence. And remember that translation is done by Jews about 200 years before Christ. This is not a Christian you know, translation, this is a Jewish translation in the Greek for Jewish Greek speaking synagogues. Ego imi ho'on, I am he who is. Now, the I am, I am, I am. No, Jesus could be just saying, I am this, I am that, I am this, I am that, I suppose. But if you look at these statements, I am, every time Jesus says, I am the light, I am the life, I am the way, I am the truth. These are pretty heavy statements for someone to be claiming. I am life, I am light, I am truth, I am the way. And then this, finally the Jews go nuts when he says it one more time. He says this in John chapter 8, verse 56. This is chapter 8, verse 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he was, and he was glad to see my day. He saw it and was glad. The Jews then said to him, You are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, This is verse 58. Truly, truly, I say to you, I mean, I mean, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. That's a weird way of talking. Yeah. Okay, so what's he saying? It's not normal English. Before Abraham was, I was. That's how you'd say that in English. Good English would be, before Abraham was, I was. If Jesus is simply trying to say he existed before Abraham, then you would normally just, in Greek... Or in English, you can say, before Abraham was, I was. Or let's put it another way. I was before Abraham was. This is how you normally would say that. If you want to say and somehow you existed before Abraham. Now, if Jesus is a regular Jew of the first century and believes he existed before Abraham, what would you do in a case like that? If, you, if walk, a guy walked up to you on the street, you just met him, and said, what, who are you? So, oh, I'm, I'm really, really old. Oh, really? What's your name? Uh, Methuselah. Mm, that's interesting. And, uh, and so how old are you? Before Noah even was born, I was there. Now you're looking at a guy who's maybe, let's say, 45 years old, 50 years old. He's been living in a gutter for a couple of years. He had a few too many drinks that day. What would you do? Would you pick up a brick and a couple of rocks and throw them at him and try and kill him? No, you'd, you'd either just keep walking. It's nice, thank you. Or you might get the guy a glass of water, maybe try to get him some shade, maybe some aspirin. So he's obviously crazy, he's nuts. But so what do the Jews do here? They pick up stones to try to kill him, to try and stone him. Now you don't normally stone a person who's having a, you know, a little bit of a psychological issue, who just thinks he's really, really old like thousands of years old, you would try to help the poor guy. But instead, they pick up stones to try to kill him. It says, so, look at this, 
they took up so therefore based upon what he said they took up stones to throw at him but jesus hit himself okay now they're not done with him look at this the net in chapter 10 in chapter 10 jesus keeps talking like this he comes back to him he says this is in chapter 10 look at verse 30 chapter 10 verse 30 i and the father are one that's pretty heavy duty I and the Father are one. Now, who's the Father? Ask your Muslim friend. Who's the Father? Well, that's Allah. That's God. Okay. Now, are you as a are you one with God? Are you are are you identical with God? Was Muhammad? Could Muhammad ever say I and Allah are one? Oh no, no, Muhammad never said. Okay, Jesus said that. Jesus claimed that. And then look what happens. The Jews took up stones again. They realized what he's saying. They took up stones again to stone him. And Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? And the Jews answered, We stone you for no good work, but for blasphemy, because you being a man make yourself God. Okay, Jesus claimed divinity? Oh, yeah. And the only reason a Muslim or a modern Jehovah's Witness can't follow it is because they're just reading the text in English. The Muslim hasn't even read the text himself anyway, just quoting what other people told him. So, I am, I am, I am. These I am statements were understood by not only the author of the text, but by the authors who wrote, you the, wrote these words and the Jews within the story these statements of divinity. Let me give you one final example of an I am statement, and then we'll move on to the, uh, well, it's another I am statement, but another text, then we'll be done. So flip over to the end of John's gospel here. This is John chapter 18. John chapter 18. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples across the Kidron Valley where there was a garden. This is John 18, verse 2. Now, Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lamps and torches and weapons. Verse 4, Jesus, knowing all that was to befall him, he knew all that was to befall him, okay, notice that, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am. And now in the English text, you get, I am he, which is good English. But it's not what it says there. In the Greek, it's simply, ego, imi, I am. It's the English translation of the divine name. Look what happens. I am. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with him. And when he said, I am, they drew back and fell to the ground. Hmm, what's going on there, Mr. Muslim? Okay, so Jesus is not only revealing the divine name, he's revealing the divine power. And the people just fall on the ground in front of him. All right. Now, there's other places where this happens, this I am statement. Again, so why didn't you say I'm God? Because he's in a Jewish context, and he's speaking to Jews, and he's using the Jewish name for God. Okay, he's not a modern American Baptist, not Jehovah's Witness, and he's not a Muslim. He's speaking the way Jews speak to a bunch of Jews. So you've got to go out to the Jewish culture and world to understand what he's saying and the, the drama. All right, look at Mark 14. Mark 14. Jesus is being interrogated by the high priest. Mark 14. Verse, uh, let's see here. Verse 50, oh, 59, no, 60, verse 60. This is Mark 14, verse 60. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? Verse 61. But he was silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ, 
the son of the blessed. They're wondering, are you the Messiah? Are you the long-awaited earthly king of the line of David that we've been waiting for? Answer the question. Remember what happened back in the beginning of Matthew's gospel? When he shows you Jesus as the human king or the earthly king, what else does he show you at the same time? He's the divine king. So look at this. But he was silent. Are you the Christ, the son of the blessed, the long-awaited Messiah? And Jesus said, I am. Now, what did he just say? He said two things. He said not only, he answered in the positive, yes, you're right. But he said something much more. Using the words I am said to the high priest something more. That is not only is he the long awaited Messiah, the son of the blessed, the son of David, but he's also the divine king. I am. And look what he says. I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Now they know Jesus has been identifying himself as the Messiah, the Son of Man. So he's not only identified himself as the long way to earth the Messiah, he's also that mysterious figure in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and following, riding on the clouds to sit on the throne of the Ancient of Days. And in all of this, he says, I am. The high priest flips out, says, that's it, blasphemy, tears his garment and says, he has committed blasphemy, let's crucify him. Okay? And then finally, so has Jesus identified himself as God? Okay, we saw the passage in John. We look at this. And then finally, look at this. And we'll end here. Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. And the only way you could follow this if you knew Isaiah, which is go there and look at that first. Revelation chapter 1. This is Jesus talking in Revelation chapter 1. Verse 8. Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. I am. I am. Egoimi. It's your divine statement. Divine name. I am the Alpha and and the Omega says Yahweh God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty, the Pantocrator. Okay? And then look, Jesus says this again throughout the, let's see here, this is verse 14. Look at, I'm sorry, verse, chapter 1, verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man clothed a long robe and with a golden girdle round his breast. His head was the hair, was the white as, as white as white wool, white as snow. His eyes were like flames of fire. John's describing Jesus as the son of man enthroned on the throne of the Ancient of Days from Daniel 7. And the Ancient of Days in Daniel 7 is God. So now Jesus has white hair and is sitting on God's throne, okay? And he says, he says, his feet were like burnished bronze, refined in the furnace, and his voice were like the sound of many waters. In the right hand, he held the seven stars. From his mouth issued a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand upon me and said, fear not, I am the first. And the last. That's right of Isaiah. Remember that? I am the first and the last. And the living one. I died. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Okay? So, did the New Testament authors claim that Jesus was God? Oh, yeah. We need another whole, we need a semester on this to go through them all. We, we flew through a bunch of passages, kind of sample passages. We didn't even look at the transfiguration. You know, the, the, the story of the glory of God descending and they want to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, which was a sign that God was dwelling among them in an earthly tent as they real, re, realized it at, the, at the event there. Think of all the different passages we can look at. We looked at some very important passages that showed the New Testament authors believed that Jesus was divine, believed that he was the God of Israel in the way they talked about him, the stories they told, but in, and in the wording they used, like in Paul. And then we find the New Testament, the other category that the Muslim apologists 
de denies exists or likes to convince the Christian of this, that Jesus never really claimed to be divine. Well, there are many examples of that New Testament, and we, in our short amount of time, looked at the most important ones. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and to ages of ages. Amen.